Let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care.
happy. Welcome to St. Mark's Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Paul Hennings, and I want to welcome you here if you're a guest with us. We're so glad you're here. Today is in the church calendar uh, year. It's Transfiguration Sunday, and so uh, that piece that you just heard would, would kind of must have been a little bit like how the disciples felt, right? So Transfiguration is when Jesus goes up onto a mountainside. He takes Peter, James, and John with him, and all of a sudden he transfigures. Literally, he becomes as bright as the sunlight. He's, his clothing turns white, and they can't even stand his presence. It's so bright, and then all of a sudden Moses and Elijah shows up. Don't ask me how that happens, but it happens. And uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke record this in the Gospels, and so we celebrate it every year. Uh, as Transfiguration Sunday. So it must have been mysterious, a little bit like that peace barb that's just like, what's going on? And Peter, uh, I'm telling you all this because I'm not going to preach on it, so forget about it. Uh, But I'm telling you all this because Peter, he's so mixed up, he says, well, Jesus, should we just put up some tents here? Let's hang out here because this is is glorious. And then, of course, Jesus doesn't say anything and uh, uh, all of a sudden, everything changes again. So it's this transfiguration experience that uh, the disciples experience on that Sunday. So we celebrate it every year. You hear little pieces about it uh, throughout our, our service today. So again, let me welcome you, everyone online. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I have one announcement that I'm required to make. Uh, We have a congregational meeting coming up in a few weeks, and so it's going to be Sunday, March 5th at 1130. We are just talking about purchasing uh, a house, and the reason for that is that if you remember any part of our our vision for the future, we're wanting to uh, help Wellington Heights Community Church and the Wellington Heights area by starting some low-cost rentals. And so every time we purchase real estate, we have to vote on it. How exciting is that? Yeah, I can tell. You're really excited. So uh, just a reminder that that's coming up here in March. We please stand now. Let's worship the Lord.
begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in prayer. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please join me now as we take time to confess our sins in silence, reflecting on how we have sinned against God and against one another. Now please join me as we pray together, acknowledging our sin and turning to God for forgiveness. We pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia.
Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, on the mountain you showed your glory in the, tra in the transfiguration of your Son. Give, give us the vision to see beyond the turmoil of our world and to behold the King in all his glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
Thank you, choir. Will you please stand now as we join together singing the Alleluia verse. for today come from Isaiah 62 and Revelation 3. Isaiah 62, 1 through 5 says this, For Zion's sake I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you'll be called he Hephzibah and your land Beulah. For the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. In Revelation 3, verses 11 through 13, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them a new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I don't know if you caught that there, um, but let me click back here. Isaiah 62 says, you'll be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. This prophecy is fulfilled in Christ and then later fulfilled at the end of time in Revelation. And uh, it's interesting, sometimes I wish they would use the same words that they use in the Old Testament to describe New Testament words. So the Old Testament calls it a diadem. But in the Greek, it's also right here, hold on to what you have so, no, so that no one will take your diadem, crown, right? It's the same thing. And so what Scripture is telling us is that the one who's victorious has a crown of life. And Isaiah is writing to a people who feel forsaken. And uh, so it is a promise to us that God never forsakes us. They also talk about a new name in here, which we'll get to in just a second. But let me say again, welcome to St. Mark's. A couple of things that you need to know. This is the last Sunday before we head into the season of Lent. And so this Wednesday, we have uh, our two Ash Wednesday services, one at 12.30 and one at 7 o'clock. So the 12.30 service will be in here, and the 7 o'clock one will be in the Life Worship Center. Then we have Lenten services every week at 12.30. Uh, you can see those on there. Instead of a Maundy Thursday service this year uh, on April 6th, we're actually going to have a Seder meal. A Seder meal is basically a Passover meal. It is what the Lord celebrated with his disciples, and it's what Jews to this very day celebrate. And what's so very cool about doing it as Christians, celebrating the Seder meal as Christians, is that um, we get to see Jesus in the Seder meal in pretty unique ways. And so that is a full meal uh, it is limited to 200 people. It is a first come, first serve type of event. You can register for that online at St. Mark's. So that's um, April 6th. And then, of course, we have a Good Friday service uh, at 7 o'clock on April 7th. All right. Today I am continuing our series on um, faith life. And it's been a three-week series, and the last couple of weeks I've talked about vision things, and I've got one last thing to share, and I really hyped up this message, so I hope that you're not too disappointed. But I can pretty much guarantee you won't be. 
uh, because it's, it's going to be a sermon. What's in the name? That's the question. Actually, the answer to that is a lot. A lot is in a name. My name is Paul Andrew Hennings. What does it mean? Well, Paul, my parents decided that one because they're Christians, and Paul's a very Christian name. I mean, if my parents would have named me Muhammad, that would have been different. I mean, I was born in Uvalde, Texas. Uh, my dad's a pastor. My mom's an organist, right? And they, they, you know, Muhammad would be different, right? Andrew is my grandfather's name. Does anybody have a middle name that's named after a grandparent? Anybody here? Really, not most of you? Okay, all right, that's all right. It's a grandparent. Andrew's my dad's dad's name. Hennings, I have no idea what that comes from. But I like to tell people that we used to be called Henningstein and had our own castle. <laughs> your, your name, I'm having all kinds of problems up here. I apologize. Let's try this again. Your name says something about you. It does. It says something about you. In fact, you, you could pretty much see somebody's name and go, there are some general assumptions that you know, okay? Um, for example, my wife's name is Ellie Iona McAllister, okay? Now, with a name like McAllister, you know something is, you know, there's got to be some Scottish or Irish or English or something in there, McAllister. It's like McDonald's. Anybody have a Mick name here? There's something in that, that name, it, you know, McDonald, you know, comes from, you guys following me here? I don't, I don't feel it. If your last name is Smith, that's because at some point in your family history, you were a blacksmith or some kind of smithy or something like that. You know, Smith, that's what it means. Ellie's name, uh, Ellie is from the uh, TV series Dallas. Anybody remember that? So her mom named her Ellie. Iona is her grandmother's name. Iona also happens to be an island uh, off Scotland. And then McAllister, they have their own uh, coat of arms. And, uh, th but they weren't, they weren't violent people. Uh, they were candle makers. And so the McAllisters were candle makers. They're not that anymore. Although, ironically, Ellie likes the smell of candles. <laughs> Ellie Iona McAllister. Your name says something about you. It really does. And in Jesus' time, and in the Old Testament time, people were named after who they were, what they were doing, their family line. You know, Jesus was Jesus of Nazareth. That's how you knew who Jesus was. And actually, names mean a lot today as well, even in businesses. These are some famous companies that I know you've heard of, but you didn't know that this was their original name. Backrub was the original name of Google. Did you know that? The founders initially called it Backrub because they thought that was cute. And after a year, they said, no, I think Google is better. And Google came, came from a misspelling of a word. And now it is in our English language. Why don't you just go and Google it? It's a verb. Cadabra, like abracadabra, that's the original name of Amazon. So if you've got Amazon Prime, you really have Kadabra Prime. That's what, that's what they wanted to call it, Kadabra, because they thought, Abracadabra, this, you're going to find everything that you need here, but it changed to Amazon. Blue Ribbon Sports, it's Nike. Nike was originally called Blue Ribbon Sports. Can you imagine Michael Jordan holding up a Blue Ribbon Sports shoe? That's just a terrible name. Brad's Drink, it's Pepsi. Pepsi was originally called Brad's Drink. You guys don't know these things, do you? It's fascinating what you learn in church. <laughs> Starbucks coffee, anybody ever heard of that? Of course. But they dropped coffee off their name about a decade ago because they decided we don't want to just be known for coffee. And the other day when I was in a Starbucks, not a Starbucks coffee, just Starbucks, I noticed how many people did not order coffee. You know, you can go to Starbucks and you can get all kinds of frou-frou drinks. And you get all kinds of 
sandwiches and cake pops and things like this. So they dropped the name from Starbucks Coffee. They dropped it just to Starbucks. Your name says something about you. People automatically make some assumptions about you when it comes to your name. And it's interesting because when you look in Scripture, God has been changing people's names for years. In fact, it is a common occurrence in Scripture that God changes names. And when I uh, read Isaiah to you, obviously, people were calling the land of Israel desolate and terrible names, and God says, no, you're going to have a different name. And then you get all the way to the end of the Bible, and Paul says this to the churches, the seven, uh, not Paul, God says this to the churches. Jesus actually says this in Revelation 3, verse 12, and he says, look, I'm going to write a new name for you. The new Jerusalem, which is the church, will have a, a new name. And so God's been in the business of changing people's names for years. For example, Abram is changed to Abraham. Sarai is changed to Sarah. We always talk about them as Abraham and Sarah, but there's a good chunk of time where it's just Abram and Sarai. Abram received the call from the Lord, and God changes their names to say, no, 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 even in your old age, you're going to have children, and they're going to be as numerous as the sea on the, uh, the sand on the seashore. Jacob, we talked about this in our last series, he gets renamed Israel. Jacob means deceiver. Israel means one who wrestles with God. Jacob's last son, we know him as Benjamin, but he was originally named Ben-Onai, which is what Rachel named him as she died, giving birth to him. So what did she name him before she drew her last breath? Ben-Onai, son of my sorrows. It's really a tragic story. And then Jacob, after she died, renamed him Benjamin, son of my right hand, because he loved Benjamin. Lo Ami to Ami, this would be one of the sons of Hosea the prophet. And prophets were, you know, Hosea especially, he, he named all of his sons according to, you know, his prophecy. And so, Lo Ami means not my people. And so it's a, his son, his son's name is a testimony against Israel. You are not my people. And then later on it gets changed to Ami. Remember, Hosea is the prophet who married a prostitute. He's my favorite. Then there's Daniel to, Daniel to Bet, uh, Bel, Belshazzar. And, um, you know, why was his name changed? Well, not because he wanted it to be changed. Daniel is his Jewish name. But remember, he's a captive in Persia. And so he was used in the Persian government. And so they changed his name to fit their culture. It's very interesting. You also have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are the, their Jewish names. I don't know what their Persian names are. You can look it up. They're terrible to say. Simon. We know him as Peter. But his name is Simon, which is a very Jewish name. But Jesus says, I'm going to call you Petros. That means rock. And of course, P Jesus is saying this, renames Simon to Peter when he's at Caesarea uh, Philippi. And, you know, he's there, and he's in front of this, this cave, which is the entrance to the, the underworld. And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name you Peter. And he looks out at the, the rock of this cave. He says, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. He's not, it's a play on words. He's not saying Peter's the first pope, folks. He's just saying, look, on this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. It's a very powerful scene. And so Simon is now called Peter after that. And then, of course, my favorite, truly, is Saul to Paul. The Apostle Paul, his original Jewish name is Saul. And later on, it, he goes by Paul. God has been changing people's names for years. And it's been an important part of Scripture. And so today, what I want to ask you or talk to you about is what if we changed our name at St. Mark's? I told you it would be a great sermon. What if we changed our name at St. Mark's to something like Faith Life Church? You know, we talk about connecting faith and life all the time. This sanctuary is called 
the Faith Worship Center. What's the other one called? Life Worship Center. What if we changed our name? Well, let me tell you a couple reasons why we would do that. See, I really believe this instrument up here does not want me to continue this message. (laughs) First thing is this. Why would we change our name? Society doesn't connect with denominations anymore. Uh, This has been going on for decades now. And to be frank, I think the Lutheran Church is a little bit behind compared to other church denominations. Um, You know, churches like Willow Creek Community Church, Saddlebrook Church, you know, they people look at those churches and they go, oh, it's a non-denominational church. Well, there's no such thing as a non-denominational church. Everybody comes from a certain stream, and most of those churches are just Southern Baptist churches, right? There are not many Lutheran churches that are not called something, something, something Lutheran church, but there are some. And in a recent survey by Lifeway Research, this is within the last year, the survey reported that 48% of American adults would not come to a Lutheran church with a church that had Lutheran in the name. They would not come to. Now, the good news there is 52% would. I mean, that's like better than Biden's approval, approval rating, right? So, you know, it's, it's good news. But that means almost one out of two people, half of American citizens that are adults, would already write off St. Mark's Lutheran Church because it's Lutheran for whatever reason, for whatever reason. Now compared to 22% for non-denominational churches. Now that's not to say that people don't just write off church altogether, but it's much less if you don't have the stigma associated with the name Lutheran on your title. The statistics are worse for Gen Zers. Society doesn't connect with denominations anymore. Now, this doesn't mean that we aren't, if we were to change a name, we we wouldn't attract Lutherans. But I would beg the question, is our goal to attract Lutherans here? Or is it to make disciples? Is our goal to bring more Lutherans from other Lutheran churches here? Or is our goal to see people saved, brought to faith? You know, faith life. I asked somebody who is a dyed-in-the-wool Lutheran a couple months ago about the idea of changing our name. And I said, hey, what, what do you think about this idea of changing our name to Faith Life Church? And she said to me, she goes, that sounds non-denominational. And I said, good! That's exactly what I want to hear from you because you would never step into any other church besides a Lutheran church. But you're the outsider in our society. You're the oddball. By the way, if I just called you an oddball or outsider, understand that I'm with you there, okay? I am Lutheran to the core. But most people are not like me. My neighbors are not like me. In fact, I have a neighbor who is born and raised in the Missouri Synod. He could tell you everything about the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, just like me, but he doesn't come to church anymore. Period. Society doesn't connect with denominations anymore. Why would we change our name? Here's another reason. Do you know that we've changed our name before? Holy cow! Did you know that we were originally called in 1885 Swedish Evangelical Lutheran Sauron Congregation of Cedar Rapids? That is a mouthful. You can't even acronym that baby, right? That was our name until 1945. Did you know that? Why in God's name would we ever change from that beautiful name to St. Mark's Lutheran Church in 1945? Well, there had to be a reason And I can almost guarantee you the reason was that in 1945, we were wrapping up World War II. And society was, and the world was in craziness. 
And the members of this congregation said, you know what, we don't want to just be known as the Swedish church anymore. And I think in 1945, they also moved to First Avenue. You can look it up. I could be wrong there. But somebody said, hey, we can't just be the church for Swedish people because there are Germans here too. And there are Scottish McAllisters here, right? And there are French people and there are other kinds of people. And so in 1945, we changed our name to St. Mark's Evangelical Lutheran Church, probably because the greatest generation was having a bunch of kids known as the boomer generation, and we wanted to be more in line with society. But we didn't stop there. In 1985, we reincorporated. We dropped evangelical off the name. I don't know why, but in 1985, we were known as St. Mark's Lutheran Church of Cedar Rapids, which is actually our name to this day. St. Mark's Lutheran Church of Cedar Rapids. Why in 1985 would you drop evangelical off of it? Well, the Lutheran world was going through turmoil in the 70s and 80s. And evangelical meant something. It associated you with something. And so we changed in 1985. And remember, in 1985, Cedar Rapids is this growing, bustling town. And we're on First Avenue. And everybody drives past our church. And it's St. Mark's Lutheran Church. Not Swedish Evangelical Lutheran Sauron Congregation of Cedar Rapids. And then in 1999-2000, we move out here. We move away from First Avenue, and Gary Hess, pastor at that time, we call our new building St. Mark's Center for Faith and Life. And when I received my call here, I made a phone call to our congregation just to see what it was like to make a call to our church, see what it's like. And Carol Byer, in her faithfulness, answered St. Mark's Lutheran, no, St. Mark's, what did she say? Oh, yeah. She said St. Mark's Faith and Life Center, and I thought I had gotten the wrong church because I thought it was just St. Mark's Lutheran Church. She answered St. Mark's Faith and Life Center. Well, what is that? We've changed our name before, and there are good reasons for it. Another good reason for changing your name is to lose the label and to keep your identity. To lose the label. We live in a society of labels. You're either gay or straight. That's a big label today. You're either Republican or Democrat. Those are big labels today. You're either white or black or not white. Those are big labels today. And it's really easy to be labeled in our society and to be misunderstood for what you're all about. And so please understand, if we would change our name, we are not jettisoning our Lutheran heritage or theology. Y'all know me well enough that that would drive me batty. I love our Lutheran theology. This is, I, I'm not going any other place. On the contrary, we're going to double down on it by making it more accessible. You see, what most people don't know is that Lutheran theology is rich in grace and mercy and faith, and it's rich in identity of who you are as a Christian. And it's not attached to some of the other identities that are out there that maybe society looks at now and says, I don't want to be part of that. But it's also needs to be detached from this old concept of Lutheranism or St. Mark's, which sounds very Catholic, doesn't it? And instead, we deliver the goods to people who don't label us before they ever step foot in here. You lose the label, you keep the identity. And then finally, why would we change our name? Because faith life aligns with our mission. We, we want people to connect faith and life. We've been saying this for years. It's been our mission ever since Gary Hess was the pastor here. And I know many of you don't know Gary Hess. He lives in Arizona for some crazy reason as a retired pastor. I don't know why. But he was all about connecting faith and life. And it's interesting because we uh, have a webpage that's stmarkscr.org. 
but our email addresses as staff are at faith-life.org. It's kind of messed up. Jim Wood, who has been here longer than any of us, I swear, Jim Wood, if you know him, he's a kid of the congregation. He's been here a long, long time, and he's on staff here. He calls our media, he calls it Faith and Life Productions. And I've told him, I said, we're St. Mark's. What's wrong with you? And he just shrugs his shoulders and he said, well, somebody mentioned this a while ago. You come over here and outside of this awning area or, or drive under it, what does it say on it? Does it say St. Mark's Lutheran Church? It doesn't say that. It says Faith and Life Center. We're confused, to be honest. And so I wonder if we can't align with our mission a little bit better. Now look, before you go home and, you know, whatever you're going to do when you go home, I want this to simmer with you, okay? This is not something that I want to survey on. I'm not looking for a vote on it. You could certainly email me all your thoughts that you'd like, but I want you just to let it simmer, okay? I want you to think about it, consider it. This is not something we're looking to do tomorrow, not at all. I want you to think about it for a while. Think about the pros and the cons. By the way, one of the cons would be this. St. Mark's has been identified as St. Mark's for, well, since 1945. So that's almost, let's do the math, 60, 80 years, right? And there's some really positive things with that as well. I'd like for you just to think about it, pray about it, see what, see what you hear the Lord saying to you about it. And then remember this, names come and go, but there's only one name that saves, and that's Jesus. Jesus means the Lord saves. It's the perfect name for our Messiah, for our Savior. And the Apostle Paul, uh, in, his, in this great hymn of the church in Philippians 2, says, Therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That means that everybody at the end of all time is going to take a knee to the name Jesus. Now, <laughs> let me take you back to the transfiguration for just a second. Peter, James, and John, they're the inner circle, and I imagine they have lots of names for Jesus, probably rabbi, teacher, friend, you know. Uh, they've got these names for him. And up to this point in his ministry, they probably are thinking, we're going up to the mountaintop to, to hear some another great teaching, and instead, he shines like God. And there on his left and his right is Moses and Elijah, and I don't know what they, names they said at that moment, but I do realize one thing, that if you see Jesus in all of his glory, it's not teacher anymore. It's, oh my God, which they finally figure out after the resurrection. When Thomas, the doubter, right? We call him doubter. The poor guy's got a terrible name. Thomas, the doubter. He's got a terrible name. Where when he sees Jesus' hands and his side, he touches them. He finally says, my Lord and my God. Because you see, Jesus is not just a teacher. He's not just a rabbi. He is God himself. And his name is the only name that saves. And it is the name that will never, ever change. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for our rich heritage and history here at St. Mark's. I am amazed all the time that, that we are over 125 years old, Lord. That is so awesome that you have been using our church to reach people with the gospel for so long. And so we give you thanks and praise. Lord, we want to keep on doing that. And as society changes, Lord, we want to break down the barriers to the gospel. Help us to do that in word and deed. Lord, give us wisdom. Give us understanding. And Lord, as we enter into this Lenten season, help us to be all in for you. 
Help us to follow you, to surrender, to sacrifice, to serve you in everything that we do. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for dying on the cross for us and rising from the grave because we know it is your name that saves. And we pray all this in your powerful name, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Will you please stand? Let's join together confessing the words that we believe in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born the Virgin Mary. He suffered in Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. This morning, Father, we give you all glory. We worship you for the goodness that you freely give us. No matter where we are in our life, you are constantly saying, come to me. Just like you're saying, come to me in this Lord's Supper. Thank God for loving us. Thank you. Help us to fully depend on you. Jesus, we know that you have special love for the children in your kingdom. We especially pray for children who are facing trauma or sickness today. Lord, we ask for your mercy and love for the children in Syria and Turkey. For those who have no home, we ask for your provision. For those children who have lost a parent or other family member, surround them with your perfect fatherly love. Be with our children in the hospital locally today at St. Luke's and mercy in an Iowa City. We pray for healing and courage for these little ones. We pray for strength and comfort for their families. Thank you for your gift of our medical professionals. Expand their knowledge and abilities and care for them as they care for others. We also want to thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving across our college campuses this past week. We pray for our local campuses, especially for the Heemstras that lead the navigators at University of Iowa. God, your spirit cannot be contained. Use this young generation to mightily expand your kingdom. Holy Spirit, move us here too at St. Mark's, and I boldly ask you to make us a kingdom-building church. Help us to say yes to your calling and trust that you will work mightily miraculously in the ways that only you can do to bring more people to declare that Jesus is their Lord. We bring all these things to you, God, thanking you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's now pray together the perfect prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
As you go on your way, may God go with you. May he go before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, and within you to give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now join as we sing our processional hymn, On Our Way Rejoicing. Please rise. <laughs> 